Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, ep next episode of our podcast, Real AI Now. Uh, we have, I'm very excited today. We have, um, uh, we have Highness here, uh, <laughs> a great guest. His name is Walt Mayo. He's the CEO of Expert AI. And um, I mean, Expert AI, he can tell you about what Expert AI does, but um, it's a great honor to have you here. Welcome, Walt. I'm thrilled to be here, Paolo. Thank you very much. Fantastic to spend some time with you on a snowy morning here in New England. I'm I'm outside Boston, as we were saying earlier. So um, thank you for um, uh, accepting to be here. Um, you are an AI pragmatist, uh, as you say yourself, and and basically, um, I'm very excited and interested in, in your opinions about um, about AI, in particular about symbolic AI and machine learning. But before we do that, can you tell us a bit about us, um, about what have you done in the past and in your career, and what? what brought you to this, um, to this field of AI? I'd, I'd be happy to, I'll try to keep it brief before we started the podcast. I had, I, I said that there was some danger that I would take the full hour of the podcast <laughs> talking about the journey that brought me yeah. here, but I'm going to be determined not to allow that to happen. Right. Um, so to, to your point around my description of myself as an AI pragmatist, um, at least in part, what I am trying to um, speak to is I'm not coming at my current role leading an AI company as an AI technologist. And, and part, of the, part of the reason for that, that I, that I want to kind of call it out, is AI in general, um, because of the breadth of its ambition to emulate human capabilities that are foundational to how we define ourselves as human beings, yeah. right? It tends to, tends to drive a couple dynamics, right? And, and one is hype. And, yeah. and that, is, for obvious reasons, it's not modest in its ambitions. Yeah. Right. And then the other is it tends to, from my perspective, create a level of polarization. In particularly among the people who are deep into the technology in a mm -hmm. way that I found somewhat surprising. OK, and I'll, I'll speak more uh, about that. So, you know, my background um, is is probably different than. A, a fair amount of the people in AI. And if you go back far enough and I'm old enough that it's very different, I'm reasonably confident about that. But I actually um, started my professional life as a diplomat with the US government. Wow. So I was in, I was in the uh, foreign service, which is the career diplomatic core of, of the US government. I did that right out of university a very, very long time ago. Um, and, uh, I had a variety of roles working in uh, in the U.S. government in Washington D.C. and then also around the world in places like uh, La Paz, Bolivia, Peshawar, Pakistan, Havana, Cuba. So wow. I had uh, I had a, a pretty broad set of experiences, but but I made a decision um, in kind of in my mid thirties where. I was looking at the, the, the dynamics that were really fundamentally changing the world, and they seem mm -hmm. to be less related to the kind of world of diplomacy and geopolitical uh, rivalry, although that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. But there was this dynamic where we were changing very, very rapidly the way we lived and worked and played, and it was being driven by technology. Right. Right. And it was happening very, very quickly. And I was looking out over the balance of my professional life. And I thought that to me looks like the most important and the most interesting dynamic that's going to occur during my professional life. Mm -hmm. 
So I made a conscious decision to leave the diplomatic world. And, and then tech. I and I and I moved into tech. And I did that by way of getting a uh, a master's in business, an MBA, right? Yeah. Um, and then I went to work for Dell. And at that time, Dell, this would have been the mid 1990s, right? So I'm going back 25 years ago. Um, Dell was introducing personal computing mm -hmm. to um, to the consumer market in a way that that no one else had before. And they had a revolutionary business model and it was extraordinarily attractive. And so I joined Dell and then building on my international experience very quickly after joining Dell, I began to work and lead businesses internationally. Mm -hmm. So I went to uh, Southern France where I had responsibility for Spain and Italy. That was my first introduction to Italy. And as you know, expert.ai was founded in Modena, Italy. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a bookend to my career. <laughs> And then I continued that for, for some while. So um, you speak Italian? Uh, yo parlo un po. <laughs> okay. Well, Puedo hablar castellano sin problema. Okay, they, they understand right. Spanish too. Yeah. yeah, I can speak Spanish perfectly well. Um, Nihongo ga skoshi hanashimasu. I speak a little bit of Japanese. Okay. Uh, <laughs> lug lug pashto habari kawalaishom, which means I understand a little bit of pashto. Um, so yeah, wow. in any event, um, out of that though, there, I, you know, I had another kind of, uh, waypoint in my professional journey. And that was where I was seeing that mo most of the innovation that was taking place in technology was taking place with, um, startup businesses around the world. And mm -hmm. so then I left Dell and I went to work for an, uh, a venture capital impact focused organization that believed that great ideas could emerge anywhere. It wasn't just in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And that the key was to give them access to the networks and to the capital that enabled Silicon Valley to thrive as a center of entrepreneurial success. Okay. So I did that for a number of years. That was actually the immediate path that led me back into my role with expert.ai. So one of, one of the investors in expert.ai, um, he and I had worked together in this impact venture capital organization. Mm -hmm. And he saw what expert AI was looking to do, which was to try to scale their business. And yeah. out of that, given my international background, my previous experience working in Italy, he brought me into the role. At that time, I had never had any previous experience with artificial intelligence, but okay. I was enormously excited about the okay. opportunity, right? Particularly language, which is where we mm. focus, right? Natural language understanding yes. and natural language processing. So that was my journey to uh, expert AI. Okay, in, in, very interesting. And um, and so can you elaborate a bit more? So you said a couple of things about, so I think we understood there. I think I understand what brought you to technology now. AI, um, you said at the beginning that um, basically AI is it creates hype. That's one one aspect. Um, you also said that um, well, it um, well there there is hype that means people exaggerate when and actually what is able to do. It's very is not humble at all in what it in 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 its uh, ambitions. Right, it really aims at uh, not only matching human performance but surpassing it in in every single way if you talk if you, if you just read the the blog articles in the news and so what what do you think about that so let's start with the hype why is it with a the hype? hype why is it a hype for you uh let's talk a bit a bit about that and why is that not good Well, I mean, the, the very simple answer is that it tends to cloud judgment, right? So when you talk about hype, what you're, when you define it, and again, you said AI pragmatist, I have in my, um, I have in my LinkedIn profile, disambiguator, 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Which is part of the software that we use in, in our technology. Yeah. And I saw that term and I just loved it. And it was actually a member of our team who said, you should be the disambiguator. And I said, I think I'm going to be. Uh, well, in fact, I mean, uh, the the before it was called natural language processing and now it's called AI whatever, it was called text disambiguation. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so. and text disambiguation, you know, the challenge there is it's a little hard to understand what you're talking about, right? Um, mm. But with hype in general, what, what you're talking about is some distortion of the truth. Yeah. That's kind of the meaning of it, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and generally, and the, sorry, sorry for interrupting. So, you, by distortion of the truth, is you mean um, by what it's distorting actually what it's able to do or inflating? Yeah. yeah. yeah um, can you still hear me all right, Paolo? My uh, my microphone, I, I think, may have gone out a bit. Or am I still coming in okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you just look at the definition of hype, right, it, it, it implies exaggeration. That's what yes. it means, hype, right? And, and that's, not, um, that's not particularly useful. It, it doesn't help people make more informed decisions. And mm -hmm. so that's the danger of hype. Now, why mm -hmm. does it happen with AI more um, perhaps than other forms of technology I think it's pretty straightforward. It's because the the scope, as you were saying, about the ambition of AI is to to try to replicate or emulate or in some cases exceed um, really foundational elements of the human uh, definition, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you know what defines us as human beings is our cognitive capability. Right? And on a spectrum, we say we're, we're different than other species because of our more profound cognitive capabilities, our advanced form of language communication, which enables us to um, accrete knowledge, right? Um, and, a, and a whole, sure, right? I mean, the, um, you know, when you think about, uh, for example, object recognition, you know, probably, uh, there's, there's pl plenty of bird species that have better object recognition than human beings. And, you know, you think about like a, a hawk, yeah, right? Clearly. Right? Who can spot, spot a mouse from a mile and a half away, right? Yeah. But what we're talking about is kind of that complex, compound cognitive capabilities that define us as human beings. Mm -hmm. And then somebody represents, I'm going to capture that and I'm going to replicate it artificially. And it is very, very unsettling. And so it tends to produce this um, exaggerated reaction, okay? And um, it's also pretty complex. It's a complex form of technology. Hmm. And, you know, quite often it requires a, a level of thoughtfulness that people don't have time for. And so they kind of very quickly pick up on what might be the latest representation of a technology capability, chat GPT being the most recent one. Mm -hmm. And then they're off to the races and uh, they're making all kinds of representations that, mm, that reflect hype and not a thoughtful way of assessing the advantages and disadvantages of a technology. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I can give you an example, right? Um, there's technology that's been available for um, since the mid 1800s that um, enabled human beings to do something um, profoundly better than they ever had before. And that's technology associated with movement, locomotion. Mm -hmm. right? So previously you had to rely on, a, uh, uh, on a, another organic uh, species, a horse, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden we developed machines that enabled human beings to move a lot more rapidly. And that had very, very profound, very profound transformations in the way yeah. human beings lived. And then so it before, moved on. So before yeah. that, before the Industrial Revolution, the best way humans had to store energy was themselves and their own muscles and uh, animals, basically. Yeah, and then exactly. when, 
when the when uh, the the steam engine was invented um all of a sudden you could store or you could use energy that was stored in the form of um coal first and then oil later and so that clearly uh was an evolution right but and here's the distinction that i wanted to offer right the fact that you can go hundreds of times faster through technology transformative but there's something about capturing a cognitive capability that is profoundly unsettling yes and that's what i think drives a lot of the hype yeah. right so I'll, I'll give you a, a recent example um with gpt which is is a large language model that has served as the foundation of the most recent representation of its capability, which is ChatGPT. It offers yep. what's called natural language generation. So with a relatively modest prompt, the technology can provide coherent, reasonably coherent, syntactically correct, grammatically correct language that to a, a human interpreter is, is structurally very sound, right? So when GPT first came out and people outside of the field, writers started to expose themselves to this technology, it was deeply troubling to them because they're writers and they were looking at a piece of technology that did more or less what they do, right? And there was a big piece in the New York Times, very long yeah. piece, right? And it was really clear that throughout it, the individual who wrote it was really, really worried, troubled, right? And, yeah. and as a result, they kind of lost a little bit of perspective, right? In a way that, you know, having a fast car doesn't kind of make you worry about your ability to walk, right? Um, so I think there's that element uh, around the the core cognitive capability mm -hmm. that artificial intelligence tries to provide that that generates that level of hype. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, as I said earlier, it's complex. It's hard to understand. And a lot of people don't take the time to be thoughtful about it. Now, in our world, in the business world, where and, and what you all do, where we're working with businesses, um, our our point of view is, Artificial intelligence offers a variety of tools and you need to be very thoughtful about it. In order to be thoughtful about it, you have to do your homework, right? So um, that's kind of the first point of departure. And then the second point of departure I would put forward is there are some elements around artificial intelligence, as with almost any other technology, that um, merit really serious consideration around potential harmful impact. Right. So the idea of using technology responsibly. Right. So those would be the two things to combat the hype, particularly mm -hmm. if you're putting your money, you know, you're working at a business and you're putting right. your money to work. Right. Be thoughtful enough to be um, discerning around what's true and what's hype. Right. And then also be responsible in in the potential impact of yeah. any technology you adopt. <laughs> And I, I, I have my own thoughts about this. I completely agree with you. Uh, just to, to start, um, there is hype, there is exaggeration. Um, there is, and if you read newspaper, um, you might even get the impression that you have an all intelligent AI that matches human cognitive capabilities, where it's not true. It's very, extremely far from matching human cognitive capabilities. Now, because, uh, so AI to me, and I, I'll give you my <laughs> view of it. I've been working with it for the last 20 years. I did a master's in machine learning in um, 20 years ago. It's going to be 20 years now, 2003. AI to me is a set of tools, is a sort of a umbrella term for a set of tools and techniques. Right? It's not it's not a general intelligence, not a 
it's not an organism like a human being that has all these um, capabilities now and it's a set of tools and you have different technologies that solve different problems they are very good at solving particular problems um that you can combine it's a tool set now it's tools like you had other tools in and in, in the information technology um and you usually a solution is usually a combination thereof of tools uh the so this is one thing the other problem the other the other aspect is ai artificial intelligence i think one of the problems is with the definition of what is intelligence and not what is AI, because intelligence is difficult to define. And depending on how you define it, you might say that AI is a hype or not. Because there are very simple forms of intelligence. Single cell organisms are intelligent. Even bacteria demonstrate some intelligent intelligence, right? And and people might say, okay, this system is not intelligence because it's not intel as intelligent as a human is not a correct assessment to, in my opinion if it uh, a system that demonstrates some kind of intelligence as uh, even if it's just the ability to make some decisions uh, based on some perceptions that it has it already demonstrates intelligence at least to me, in my point of view, and it could be called AI. So I don't really get bothered about the use, the misuse of the term AI, because to me, even something that is based on logic, if then else, is AI, right? And that's, but I think that's the problem because when people hear about intelligence, they think humans or animals, they don't think bacteria or even, uh, or, uh, unicellular organisms or even subsystems of these organisms that demonstrate intelligence. Would you agree with this? Well, so you're, you're being very profound here and uh, yeah. yes, I would. I, I, I think that, um, that with any term that you use, it should help clarify thinking or you shouldn't use it. Right? Okay, good point. So <laughs> that's kind of straightforward, right? So you yeah. say, if this doesn't help, I'm going to assign a category, right? Yeah. And if this doesn't help people understand more clearly what it is that I'm talking about, then it's not useful, right? Yeah. I think artificial intelligence right now is- It's not useful. Not super <laughs> useful, yeah, okay? I agree. So you kind of start there and you say, well, okay, look, I mean, people are, uh, it's too generic. It could be confusing. Yeah. It's, it's way too generic. It's so, you know, way somebody, too ambiguous. You, yeah. yeah. If you went to somebody and you said, um, what do you do? And you say, um, I'm a, um, carpenter. They would say, oh, okay. So you work with wood. Uh, what type of carpenter? Well, I'm a, uh, finish carpenter that is i work on very fine things you say oh okay great and then you're done because they understand what you're talking about right right somebody says what do you do <laughs> oh i work in artificial intelligence really wow. What, wow. what do you do in artificial intelligence and then you can put forward a, just such a wide variety of different things you know computer vision mm -hmm. object recognition natural language understanding right so i mean because it's new enough um I suppose it's it we're stuck with it. It's not super helpful uh, right now, honestly, and it does kind of drive that that hype. Um, so you know, to your point, and I'll, I think we should talk about it later, and we're going to get into it. Um, but at the end of at the almost at the end of any discussion it's kind of like why is the person in front of you well they're in front of you because there's some intent you you and i are um are in the same field we want to have an interesting conversation about our shared pursuit we think it might be valuable to the listeners that's why we're here very straightforward right mm -hmm. i'm sitting across the table from uh, an executive at an insurance company he or she has a challenge around their business or an opportunity. That's the intent. 
Okay. And then yeah. you want to get to intent as quickly as possible. And then you say, does introducing AI as a category help expedite your ability to get to intent? And as often as not, the answer is no, it probably doesn't. Not, no. Right. Probably not. Right. Uh -huh. um, so it's problem definition. And yeah. then it's um, tool definition. And you say, does the tool that we have available help to address the problem or put another way, is the problem tractable with the tool? Right. So I, I agree with I you. I think we're um, stuck with it, though, uh, Paolo, <laughs> for a while. So we're just going to have to live with it. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, so let's do that. Let's. Uh, there is this cartoon that I uh, saw the other day. There's a question. Uh, so do you guys use AI in your business? And the answer, no, we just use some statistics and a little bit of machine learning. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and what some people would just call that AI, which is very confusing. If it's statistics and machine learning, it gets a bit narrow, but machine learning is still too wide. <laughs> so but let, let's dig deep. Let's dig a bit deeper, right? Sure. Um, into expert AI and um, natural language processing, right? So when I was at university uh, in the 90s, um, second half of the 90s, um, well, one of the major topics in at the time was AI, artificial intelligence. There were different disciplines of that. There was uh, all kinds of different algorithms, Machine learning was one of them, but there was also one thing called expert systems, mm -hmm. which was, I, I think the, the name of the company, your company, Expert AI, comes from... Expert that, system, yep, that's what we call ourselves. So. Yeah, comes from expert that. Expert systems, just as you said, yeah. Yeah, so the expert systems is actually a sort of a discipline of that mm -hmm. of AI. Um, but there were others like planning and scheduling. There was all kinds of, even game playing and with all these algorithms to play games. So this was all, and machine learning was one of them uh, with different techniques. So AI at the time was all of these things and natural language processing. There was also something around that, but very, very little in this like 25, 20 years ago, there was very little conversation about uh, natural language processing. So, um, could you talk a bit about that? What is expert system? What is an expert system, which I believe is um, where your company comes from? And mm -hmm. how does that relate to that other uh, part, which is natural language processing? And maybe give us some examples of what kind of problems you can solve with that technology. Sure. Um, so when you... You start at the at the highest level and you say natural language processing. And to our earlier conversation around categories should help illuminate, not obscure what you're talking about. Yeah. That's one that's again not super helpful, right? <laughs> okay. Um so by natural language, we just mean the language of human beings as opposed to uh, artificial language, which would be like a machine language. Yeah. Right. So uh software code is an example of of a machine language. Yeah. Um, and then you say processing. I think most people understand that in some form you are um, accelerating, manipulating, changing, um, performing operations on, on language, right? And um, if you go back to the, the early days, and I'm actually reading, I'm being a little bit ambitious. Um, I'm reading a book about Kurt Godel now. Um, and he kind of spawned some of the very, very early thinking around how you could codify knowledge in a symbolic fashion. And mm -hmm. then Alan Turing was one of, one of the people that, and, and John von Neumann. And so I'm going back early days and they were saying, mm -hmm. well, there's elements of human knowledge that you can actually codify in a way and represent symbolically such that a machine could actually perform um, tasks in a way that emulate uh, the, the human cognitive capability. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So that was the very early days. And a lot, I think a lot of people remember the, um, yeah. the Turing test. Right. And then um, there was a, a movie that came out called the imitation game and yeah. um, the, the Turing, Turing test. Yep. Alan Turing. Right. And so what, what he put forward was kind of this thought experiment where he said, what if you had an observer and there were um, two actors behind screen and you put the challenge to the observer of trying to determine which of the actor was a machine and which of the actors was a human being. And there are some variations on the experiment, but that's broadly what it was. And um, what he put forward was a, a, a notion that at the point at which the, a human could not consistently identify the machine actor, right? At that point, you would have approached yes. some important level of, of human capability yeah, around basically, language. Basically, yeah. the machine passed the Turing test or the, AI or the human it. or the human failed the Turing <laughs> test, right? Right. You could look at it either way because yeah. it's really for the human to decide, right? The human was right. the, so it, it was the two sided. Uh, equation. The, um, and so one of the disciplines that emerged was this idea of an expert system. And the expert system, the, the thought behind that was if you could capture and map the series of considerations and decisions that an expert renders in arriving at a sound conclusion, mm-hmm. right? then you could replicate it at scale using machines. Right. So you capture the the knowledge of an expert in a certain field and exactly. you try to get the machine to to do that. Um, to replicate it. To replicate it right? at scale. So uh, in yep. theory, being able to do the job of 100 experts at scale. Exactly. Yeah. So... Um, there were two elements to it, right? One was the knowledge consideration, right? So what are the elements that we know to be important in a decision, Mm -hmm. right? And then the decision path. So how do you move through the decision path to arrive at an outcome, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I saw an example of that that was applied to chat GPT and it was a decision tree. So that's really, really what it is. And actually, with all the complexity of deep learning, there are there, there's a growing recognition that it is a, another form of extraordinarily complex decision trees. Okay, so there's, you know, put that to the side and say, well, okay, <laughs> I don't really care one way or the other, right? But in, in an expert system, given the technology, and it was primarily driven by compute and storage, it was a very clearly defined um, Mm-hmm. Uh, approach to emulating the way people consider knowledge and make decisions, right? So mm-hmm. um, the, the application of that for chat GPT, it was um, how to decide whether to use chat GPT or not, right? And so the first decision node was, does it make any difference if the answer is true? And it said, <laughs> if yes, and then it went and it ended. Because then it said, don't use chat GPT. Right, because it's not deterministic. You don't, not sure. It's not deterministic, exactly, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Now, the criticism of of an expert system was that it was brittle, right? So it was really hard to capture all the knowledge and Mm -hmm. to emulate the um, complexity of the decision-making process. So so this this expert systems, right? um, What do you think about that? So uh, there are, when you need... Um, deterministic decisions by a system like that, um, you need to have some sort of rules, um, some kind of um, formalization of how people make decisions. And and if you want them to be deterministic, you want to absolutely, in this situation, there must be no ambiguity. You must decide this way, right? Of course. Um, If you want that, now, what are you obviously need some some kind of rules, some kind of I I I, I like to think it as it as so it's protocol, it's procedure, it's um, and sometimes even a code of conduct needs to be something like that, right? And 
But what are the limitations with that? So my experience, because I've I've tried and I've made attempts and some more successful than others to in the past um, in deploying uh, using expert systems to solve problems. One of one of the issues was there was a degree of so if you need to capture experts' knowledge, there is a degree of resistance by those people in actually. Uh, formalizing what they do in rules and helping be replaced by a machine. So this is one. The other one that I observed was um, the the scalability of, of this. So it's hard to it's hard to scale. It's hard to um, many times. It's often hard to. It takes a lot of work to create those rules, even if you, people are willing to do it, and then to maintain them. And it's it takes a lot of manual work to 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 yep. keep to, to 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 basically do the maintenance of, of such a system. That was the experience. Those were the actually the main two issues with it. Do you have the same impression? Do you have other another experience? I think those are two objections that are raised. And I think you occasionally run into them in the real world, um, but it's a little bit like the, you know, the argument around the two business folks who are ha who are really in a in a heated conversation, and the one says, "Well, you've proven that it will work in practice, but what about in theory?" Right? <laughs> and and so, yeah, I mean, you know, theoretically, um, it can get unwieldy and you need to be mindful of that. And then um, as a practical matter, sometimes it is difficult for um, to capture the knowledge because there's some internal resistance to it. But the, the long history of failed software projects of any kind, right? Yeah. I mean, you... <laughs> You don't have to go to artificial intelligence and even further into expert system to mm -hmm. find out there's been a very, very long track record that's basically well, just predicated. Think S, just think of SAP. <laughs> SAP, you know, and I don't want to pick on them, but but you well, the the, the nature of the problem, like formalizing a business process in, exactly. in an ERP system, is yeah, and, it's and, not and, SAP's you know, fault. It's just it's difficult. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, even in the insurance world, right, we work with um, platforms where they say the implementation will take three years. Yeah. And you start <laughs> and you say three years. Oh. I mean, come on, <laughs> really? And they say, yeah, because it's super complex. And you go, OK, well, uh, let's be sure that it's <laughs> going to make a difference. Right. Um, mm. So you start off and you say. Do I have a reasonable degree of alignment in the organization to the benefit that I'm hoping to offer through my technology? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, I can tell you, right? I didn't, I didn't, I never watched the movie Titanic, right? Because I already knew the ending, right? It does <laughs> okay. not end well. <laughs> okay. That's, and I can tell you right point. now, if that's you start off point. and you say, we're going to do some meaningful part of software implementation, and it is going to have a meaningful impact on the way the human beings in the organization do their work. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they're aligned to it or not. That's not a good outcome. I can tell you that right now. I don't have to watch the movie. Yeah, so, right? And that's not AI specific or expert system specific. It's, it's this true is... of anything. It's like any, any change. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's true of you know, building a new highway, whatever, right? Mm. Better make sure that the people who are impacted understand what's going to happen and see it broadly as a benefit or expect that they won't like it and might even resist. Now, that's a broader point. To your point around the more specific, can you bound the problem narrowly enough so that it, it is tractable with a mm. symbolic approach? That's yeah. meaningful. Yeah. And what I say with that is to my earlier point around a carpenter if somebody comes to me and says 
I want to renovate my house, which I've done. And they say, um, what tools are you going to use? You're going to name a bunch of different tools. I'm going to say nail, hammer, screwdriver, saw, right? Yeah. Wood. Each one of them. Going to use yeah, wood. <laughs> there's materials involved, right? So <laughs> each one of them plays a different role. And you just want to be relatively thoughtful about which one you apply. So when it's a hammer problem, use the hammer. When it's a, you know, a, a <laughs> drill problem, use the drill, right? And so with yeah. symbolic, you know, be careful. And that's what we do. We offer what we call hybrid AI, where we take machine learning, where it yeah. works well, where the problems are tractable, and then we take symbolic. the The benefit of symbolic is that it is deterministic. So when you know things to be true, right? There's no reason to go through the exercise of trying to predict them, right? Which is what machine learning does. Yeah. So our, our, you know, our point of view, and I put this as well in my LinkedIn profile, um, which is probably too long now that I mention all the different things in my LinkedIn profile, but yeah. um, I talk about Occam's razor. And Occam's razor is the principle of William of Occam. And he yeah. said, look for the simplest answer that works. Right. So that's what you should do. So you should say, what's the simplest answer that can work hmm. in the AI world? Often it's don't use AI, use some statistics, right? Some basic regression techniques. That's probably good enough. Right. Yeah. Um, and if you know something to be true and in, importantly, you want to be able to explain it in a transparent way, then an expert system or symbolic approach is probably appropriate all right so when when is it not appropriate there are some you know there are some specific tasks associated with um i mean clearly for example if you are looking at pictures and try to detect objects and right. pictures yep right, they're just so we, clearly we actually, not, yep yeah. so we come across that in our our software where there's um, language information contained in a logo, for example. That's really an object recognition or computer vision, OCR yeah. problem, right? And, and symbolic doesn't work for that terribly well, right? Um, there's also some things where, you know, in general, if it's a very large data set and the elements associated with it are relatively common, then some machine learning problems are quite tractable with that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, some business problems are quite tractable with machine learning more properly, yeah. right? Um, the, you know, the challenge is that in, in the business world, often um, it's difficult to find a problem that is generalizable enough to use machine learning, but is specific enough to add value uniquely to you. So the companies that have done really well using machine learning have bounded their problems very narrowly. And, and they, they're saying, here's a problem that many companies have, but it's specific enough that um, we can define it in a way that adds value to a lot of different Uh, companies without having to change it very much, right? So think about, say, a um, account payable process, yeah. right? That's broadly similar for almost every company. And most of the characteristics of it are relatively common. And the workflow associated with it is, is generally pretty straightforward. And the, the, the endpoints are generally straightforward forward, right? And it's generally feeding into an ERP, very narrow definition like that. Machine learning tends to do pretty well, right? So we, we look for what combination of tools best solves the problem at hand. And that's, that's why we have hybrid AI. Okay, interesting. So one of the things that um that uh well the top one of the topics of of uh, of today is the fact that um well, there it's uh, basically ethics right um and or responsible ai if you 
if you prefer. Uh, ethics is a part of that. <laughs> of responsible AI is a responsibility is a bit broader, a broader term. But um, let's talk about a, a bit about that because I think that it, it is connected to what you said, right? So, um, what are the issues right now with uh, regarding, for example, let's start with ethics. What are the problems or the challenges with machine learning uh, around uh, around ethics that you see? You know, I had this, I had the kind of a similar conversation a while ago, and I was struck by the fact that people feel the need to talk about responsible AI. Mm -hmm. uh, because generally in most other industries, you don't have to put responsible in front of it. <laughs> it's okay. what, because it's implicit or it's implicit, right? So okay. you don't have to say <laughs> responsible <Yeah>. restaurants. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay? that's true. I mean, because the, the, you're assuming that they're taking some level of care with the yeah. preparation of the food that's going into you so mm -hmm. that you don't get sick. Mm -hmm. And actually, you probably don't have to assume that much because there are authoritative agencies that ensure that right. they're responsible. Right? Yeah, they're, it's regulated, basically. It's an old... Industry. Exactly. Okay. So you go, if I'm going to eat something, I want to know the government has done something to make sure that it, I'm not sick. Now, you can go out all the way to the kind of libertarian spectrum and you can say, no, just let the market go. And the people who get <laughs> sick at restaurants, well, you know, they'll know not to go to that restaurant next time. Personally, I'm kind of like, yeah, I want to know any restaurant I walk into is going to be fine. Yeah, uh, exactly. I used to when you if you buy a I don't know if you buy a lotion for your face that it has been it's, tested, it, it is, yeah, it's <laughs> not going to make like really mess you up. Yeah. <laughs> then you um, you know, um, responsible airlines, right? So mm. nobody says we're a responsible airline, right? Because to distinguish ourselves from everybody else, who's an irresponsible airline, and you're like an irresponsible airline. I mean, come on, no way. Right. <laughs> so, um, but for some reason, and I'll tell you, I think it's a very clear reason and I'll just be super straightforward around it. Right. Um, the, uh, the technology world has um, in particular in this gray area where the implications are not immediately harmful. Okay. So when they mm -hmm. release chat GPT, and, and things started going a little bit weird, like 10 people didn't die the next day, right? So it's not like an immediate harm, okay? Right. Um, so they can kind of get away from it. And so the argue, get away with it. And so the argument is always any attempt to be, impose a more thoughtful structure to the introduction of technology will stifle innovation. So that's the main argument, okay? Yeah. Behind that, I think, is a more basic argument, and I think it, it has to do with greed, right? So um, now I can think of another area that is extraordinarily important where innovation is critical and is unbelievably regulated, and that's in the life sciences field, right? So we yeah. say... It's critically important that you innovate, but we're going to be unbelievably strict around the level of innovation that you do to ensure nobody gets harmed. And yeah. that's just that, okay? So well, because we operate in this gray world where the consequences of irresponsible AI are ambiguous, right? right? I mean, uh, I, I, guess, I guess it because AI or let's say this kind of technologies um, can be used across different industries. Now, if you try to do introduce um, AI or machine learning, let's say let's 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 be a bit more specific in a medical device that sort of makes decision life supporting decisions, then 
I'm pretty sure that industry is, is going to be regulating that and it's going to, um, it's not going to let you do that. Now, if you do it in e-commerce, which is very new, it's a fairly new industry, then, well, uh, if you make the wrong yeah. recommendation so what? to your customer, then basically it's effect, it's going to affect your revenue. It's, That's is right. it really affecting the customer? Even if it does, they're not going to die because of that. Um, yeah, because so, they bought the wrong lotion, right? Or because they bought... Um, yeah. The lotion itself needs to be regulated, but by, by lotion A or B... So this, it's like a net, like a Netflix recommendation. You get a bad recommendation for a movie. Who cares? Yes. Right? It's going to affect your yes. willingness or, to use the product. Or no, you the, the the ads that you get when you do a Google search, or yeah. the the ads that you see when you're on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, these are all, all these are all based in a in AI, machine learning systems, and um, that predict what is the best to show to this person right now. So, but they don't really need, if they do a prediction which is not good, which happens all the time, right? Uh, especially, uh, and basically, it doesn't harm anybody. So I, I agree yep. with you. And so, But so there's a lot of consequences of not doing this. That's, that's where I wanted to go with it. That okay? are not immediate. And these are the ethical things. So what are the issues, right? Could you, yep. could you help us? Yeah. So that's... The- the issues that's that, where that, I was going is, with yeah. with my point, right? So if you were to say, um, I want to introduce machine learning powered autonomous drones with lethal force capability. Wow, yeah. People would say, no, no way, <laughs> right? What if they kill the wrong person, right? So yeah, right. that's really troubling. So it's that whole gray area. So there's two two actors then producer and consumer Mm -hmm. and responsible AI is on both of them. That's my point. Okay. Producer. That is the companies who generate technology that uses this new, very powerful form of, of, uh, of software that emulates human decision-making capability or in whatever capacity or object recognition. So for example, in facial recognition, you are getting a lot of pushback for obvious reasons, Mm. right? Even things like, for example, in the generative AI space, something that seems fairly frivolous, like Lenza, right? So that's the app where you can take one your image and it will render the image in in a variety of different ways that's, that's kind of fun. well, MIT Technology Review, which if you want to read any single source of thoughtful consideration of responsible AI, I would add that to your mix, mm-hmm. right? So there's a woman there who's a very thoughtful writer, and she used Lenza, and it was coming out with really exaggeratedly sexual representations of her, mm-hmm. right? Well, you know, because she was a woman. <laughs> that was the only reason why I was doing it. And it was doing it because it had been trained on the way women are portrayed on the internet. So this is bias, right? You're talking about bias. Yeah, a tremendous amount of bias there, <laughs> right? So bias is one that you have to be very, very careful with in machine <laughs> learning. Because machine learning is basically, it is trained in some capacity around a very large set of data. You have to be super thoughtful around what that data contains because the output of the machine learning capability will will reflect that. Will right? be biased. When we see it, it will reflect that bias for mm-hmm. sure. Right. So that's being responsible. Again, for the people who put it out and for the people who consume it. Okay. Another area is around explainability. So if you're making a decision that has a real world impact on a person's life, you need to be able to explain how you arrived at that decision, right? Yeah. Yeah, Because you're accountable for it. And if you can't explain it, right, or you can't change it relatively easily or modify it, that's a problem. 
because at the end of the day, we are accountable for the decisions we make in our work yeah. and in our lives, right? Um, yeah. the, and you know, the, 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 fun, the one last one that I will throw out there as well yeah. is you need to be careful about any externalities. And the externalities are how is the technology produced? And one of the things that has emerged is that in some of the really more advanced forms of deep learning in large language models, right? They're mm -hmm. incredibly computationally intensive. So they have a big carbon footprint, right? There's yet another element and it is a decision that you need to consider. If there is a technology that is emerging and it's relatively important, should it only be controlled by a very small handful of the largest companies in the world? Well, we're, we're citizens. We should make that choice, right? It's not it's a fait accompli, really. right? It's, it, is quite, um, it is quite dangerous. Our, our, um, in, in some cases, uh, uh, so there are a few, there's a handful of companies right now, maybe more than a handful, and maybe a couple of states um, as well that hold this technology in their hands and they are more advanced than the others. At least it looks like they are. Um, and this is also an issue, I agree. Well, I, I mean, you. if you think about OpenAI, which is the organization that produced ChatGPT, yeah. right? Its initial charter was to ensure that technologies that worked towards generalized artificial intelligence would be open and accessible and not yeah. under the control of a single not, large corporation. It's not, it's, an, it's supposed to be a, a foundation or a nonprofit. And now it's going to be owned by Microsoft. Is that? Well, <laughs> so... <laughs> Microsoft just invested $10 billion. <laughs> Uh, which kind of, I agree, I was talking about this the other day. Um, yeah, and then there is uh, Google, obviously, and and Facebook uh, or Meta. Um, there, there, there are a few players around, and Amazon, and there are a few players around the world. There's not a lot of them that are at this level, I would say. And maybe states uh, doing some secret things. I don't know what the, what China is doing. Nobody knows what China is doing. <laughs> um, I can't help you there. Well, I definitely not, do not know. Not uh, not asking no. you. Uh, so there are, it, there is this concentration of of power because technology and knowledge is power. Um, that is, uh, that I agree with you. Is it, I mean, for us, getting back to uh, re responsible AI, right? Yeah. So. Um, we have a simple definition. We want to provide technology that reliably and efficiently does useful things for companies. Yep. Okay. Implicit in that is it doesn't do other things that are not useful. Okay. So reliably, meaning it, it's not random and it won't produce um, unwanted outcomes efficiently because to my earlier point around Occam's razor, and that's also what businesses should look for, but we're also speaking to the, uh, the, we call it green glass, right? Green glass means transparent and as energy efficient as possible, as opposed to black box, okay? Yeah. And then does useful things, right? So, you know, solves problems that hopefully make people's lives better, that eliminate some of the, the uh, drudgery of their work and enable them to um, focus on where they can add the most value in a company, right? So that's what we do. Yeah. That's kind of the real world of responsible AI. Yeah. But to my point, you know, for any for anyone considering um, any any purchase in a business, the, the, it is important for them to ensure that they're being responsible about the tech, the technology, or the service, or the good that they acquire, right? Mm -hmm. And that applies to AI as much as anything else. All right. So how do you see this evolving? I mean, I, I agree with you. I also agree that um, 
companies should be should look at the problem start from the problem not from the solution not from the technology start from the problem um do they want to be more efficient do they want to um relieve humans from dull tasks re repetitive dull um tasks and those are things that i know for a fact that your company helps doing um automating uh paperwork for example uh that is that is repetitive and gets dull um but also simple decisions if a person needs to sit down every day in front of a computer reading forms typing things from that are in a piece of paper into a, a they, doing data entry in another system and that's all all they do the whole day well <laughs> these are the things that kinds of problems that uh, technology should be solving and and even some decisions. Uh, so I, I, I agree with you. Um, now, um, but there is this. There, there are the. There is this new technology um, that has been <clears throat> has been introduced in the last year. So uh, the the these new large language models and large transformer models that came. I think around 2017, there was this paper, famous paper called "Attention is All You Need," that introduced transformer models. Yep. Since then, things have been evolving in this world at an astonishing pace. Um, so, GPT-3, uh, GPT-3 is a descendant of those um, of that paper, right? Mm -hmm. And and of others, but that was a sort of a like a a uh, point in time where um there that was, was something that was the that was the kind of the critical development for sure right they introduced the tension to these trans large transformer models and this turned out to to be very good at looking at text which is basically a sequence and remembering in the short term what happened so that he can predict what comes next sort of the this this kind of thing now um it's very difficult, it's not impossible to do a deterministic thing out of this technology, at least not yet. You cannot. Um, now, how do you see this play out, right? I I believe that hybrid is the way to go, right? You need to, you will go in a direction where you will have rules or you have sim uh, the symbolic approach um, to problems that are known, things that are known, you will use this approach to things that you don't know as well. You cannot, they are difficult to formalize as logic or as rules. Now, what role will one play in the other, right? And in, in, in your point of view, because clearly this technology is here to stay and it's going to continue to evolve and sure. grow. Now, how do, how do the two things play out in your point of view? Well, together? To, to start with, in, in the very large language models that um, we've seen since 2017, and, and G, GPT-3 was probably the first that became heavily popularized, I think that um, behind the scenes, Google has long had this capability, right? So they have their own language model called Lambda. Yeah. And um, yeah, definitely. Go Google has very deliberately, I believe, not popularized the uh, capability because of their, I believe at least, some of their concern about the unintended consequences of it, right? And OpenAI, which has operated under this umbrella as a foundation, has, I think, kind of taken advantage of that and, um, you know, at one point they said they were not going to release the code associated with uh, GPT because they didn't want it to become a source of disinformation. And then they push uh, chat GPT out into the public and they've created a huge amount of, of hype going back to our earlier conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're going to pretty quickly uh, end up in court, right? So it, um, I think both in the in Europe and the United States, there's a um, 
a very high likelihood that the way in which these technologies are produced is going to fall under the jurisdiction of the court. And they're going to say that um, you're not passing what's called a fair use doctrine. You're using other people's work without mm -hmm. their permission and you're making money from it. So I think that's going to happen pretty quickly. It's already happening now, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can look at Dolly, which is the, um, the text to image. And yeah. people are, are showing Dolly images where you can clearly see the person's name who originally produced the art, but it's been rendered and transformed in some way, but their yeah. name's still there. And they're not getting any money off of that. And who gave them permission, <laughs> right? So right. I think that's one thing that's going to happen. And I think that's going to be a little bit sobering for folks. I suspect that um, there's going to be a lot of lawyers at a minimum who make a lot of money off of this. I'm not sure how the rest of us are going to do. Um, yeah. But I think that's going to settle itself out pretty quickly, right? Okay. I don't think that'll change a whole lot about very large language models. I think what then is going to happen is... But this is, going... a, but this is sorry for interrupting, but I mean, you were talking about the fact that they use data to train this large model that right. doesn't, doesn't belong to them and they shouldn't have been using it because that's it's right. not theirs to, to be. Right. It's not, they don't have a, the license and they have the right to use it in this way. That's right. Um, but this is not a technology thing. So this can be fixed actually. And there will be- I think it will be. You can use the same technology to produce something that is a lot more responsible than what they did. Do you agree? I agree. And I think what will happen is that there will be um, pretty quickly a, um, a series of guardrails around how you can use data. I mm -hmm. think it'll be both ways. So it'll be, what can you use? For example, if somebody creates an image, they can say, do not train. You can't train anything on this image without my permission in any, in any capacity, right. right? Now, so I don't know that it'll change a whole lot because everybody goes through things like the end user license agreements without ever reading them. And basically you sign away your life for access to the data. <laughs> People do that all the time and it happens like that, right? Mm. But I think that'll be one. I think the other thing is um, anything that is generated um, artificially is going to have to be so identified. So I think the government's going to come in and say, if you generated this. Like needs a watermark it, or something. Exactly. Right. And that should be true of an image as well. Right. So deep fakes are obviously one that, that's troubling. And so you need to know, and it needs to be explicit. This was generated by a machine. This is not a human representation. And if you make, if you try to tell people that it was a human representation and it's not, it's against the law and you're going to be in trouble. Right. So period. Because right. otherwise there we lose be, all ability. There should be a, there should be a watermark uh, in it. There should be a clear, uh, Absolutely. readable, human readable and machine readable watermark that, that, reveals how it is, how it was generated and so this is this is important right i think and that if it I doesn't think... have one then um then it's illegal so uh, i was reading about this the other day uh like uh, introducing watermark in gener generated content by generated models now and then with, when content is generated by people or using different tools, there should also be a watermark that certifies that was, this was done by a person. So that you put your name on it, right? That should be enough. <laughs> should um, be. <laughs> For people, for machines, maybe. Um, no, you need a watermark. I agree with you. Because, right? be, because then, uh, well, I can always say that something was produced by somebody else, or I can take credit for some somebody else's work and put my name on it. And if that's easy to do, <laughs> then that's also. Well, but uh, yeah, you know, uh, you're asking you're asking about hybrid AI, right? And yeah. you know, the way we define hybrid AI is using a different type, uh, a variety of different types of artificial intelligence to achieve tech uh, approaches, primarily machine learning and symbolic, right? Yeah. But really, I think what we're going to move more and more to is um, hybrid AI is really. Uh, man and machine, right? Yeah. So if I write an email and I use the auto suggest or I use spell check, I don't particularly have to tell anybody 
hey, I use spell check on my email. So, right, no, nobody cares. They're, they're pretty much okay with that. Um, I think what um, the gray area is going to be, well, what, what about the stuff in the middle, right? Yeah, so if where, you think about some- Where do you like draw Mark, the line? Yeah, exactly. Um, you could always say, okay, write me write an email to Paula saying, uh, thanks for uh, uh, inviting me to participate on the podcast and use some kind words and that uh, fill his ego, right? And the AI <laughs> yeah, that's true. Generate something, and I don't know. If yeah, it... I mean, you know, um, <laughs> but the intent—that's the key. Yeah, intent. Because the AI doesn't have intent. Right. Right. And so I think what it comes back to again and again, and this gets back to this idea of responsible, right? Mm -hmm. So underlying your intent, are you being responsible? Right. And if the intent is to mislead, yeah. you're on the hook, whether you do it yourself or a machine does it for you. So responsibility, right. as you say, come from both parts. So the the people who train these models need to be responsible in the way they do it. The people who use them also need to be responsible about it because they can be used for harm. Absolutely. And, or I mean, <laughs> on, on non-ethical ways. And well, and, but so these are I mean, kind look. of these are these are new new technologies and it's not really clear yet how to regulate them, is it? No, but I think people are gonna have to grapple with that. And the idea that we will be stifling innovation is nonsense. No, it's I just agree. nonsense, okay? When Microsoft puts $10 billion into open AI, we're not at the cutting edge of innovation. We're at a very, very large company giving a very extraordinary amount of money to a single mm. organization. We need to be looking at that. Now, I'm not picking on OpenAI and I'm not picking <laughs> on Microsoft. I'm just saying that generalized argument around don't stifle innovation is nonsense. The, um, if you take a step back and you would just, just say, attention is all you need, 2017, right? Mm -hmm. And then you say six years later, you say, in 2017, pick the problems that would be most beneficial to solve using this technology, okay? That would make people's lives better. I don't think you would say, give them the ability to put out more coherent nonsense language. We're drowning in it. <laughs> coherent nonsense, that's a good expression. That came from to... Forrester, not me, okay? okay? I need to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> coherent but nonsense. We're... I think you shared a LinkedIn post about that. I, I did, that, yeah. yeah. Coherent nonsense. That's a great term. It's actually, yeah. it's very accurate. Very accurate. We're, we're drowning in it. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's and a And then challenge. the other one is, is to say, put out more randomly generated images that are kind of silly and fun. Now, if you said those are the two most important applications <laughs> of this breakthrough technology, again, I would say, okay, let's go back to 2017. Where were researchers with mRNA vaccine treatment? My guess is in 2017, they were working on it, yeah. right? They were. Yeah. And guess what happened in 2020? It went to work and changed people's lives. And if, of course, you know the incredible impact that artificial intelligence had in the global pandemic, right? Hmm. Well, no, you don't, because there was no impact. Artificial intelligence was unbelievably absent from okay. the most important global event that occurred in the last five years. You mean like absent from being a solution Making to any anything? Making any difference. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, well, in, ter in terms of fixing the, the pandemic, uh, no. There was what, no what tended to happen was most of the, and this gets back actually to this machine learning and symbolic challenge, right? Machine learning and deep learning works very well when the future resembles strongly the past, right? Yeah. 
But when there's any discontinuity, it falls right off. And that's exactly what happened with all kinds of models that were associated with pre-pandemic behavior. And and, and also with models that were trained uh, during pandemic times uh, on people's behaving during that times. Now, when we are getting back to normal, or actually it's the new normal, it's a new reality, the way people behave, it's not the same as during the pandemic, not the same as before. Uh, well, none of them and, are working either. So they need to. Yeah. Be... And so, so look again, getting back to this idea of responsible AI. And all I will say is if you're buying technology, if you're buying software that is meaningfully powered by AI, ask hard questions. You can look at the example of Zillow, right? Zillow is a real estate listing company platform. Mm -hmm. where you can get information about what rents are and what house prices are, right? Zillow built the ability to directly purchase home because they had access to an incredible amount of information, right? They ended up losing billions (laughs) of dollars, right? This is... Because they were way, way over-reliant on the output of machine learning capability that had limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, trying to predict, um, trying to predict the market, in this case, the real estate market, uh, uh, it's it's a very dangerous thing to do because as soon as you start buying things in the market, you're already affecting it. So it's, it's <laughs> it, it it's not i mean it we can work with short term trading day trading but not real estate medium and long term this is same thing happened with used cars <laughs> there was another company that did the same thing with used cars and they ended up just getting clobbered right? right so look if you're a business person and again that's who i deal with primarily right um right. but i would also say as individuals i think we would all benefit from being a little bit more thoughtful around the kind of technology that we're using and the unintended consequences of that technology, where it came from, right? So look, we, um, as I said, our job is pretty straightforward and this goes back to my AI pragmatist, right? We wanna provide technology that reliably and efficiently does useful things for companies. There Mm -hmm. you go, all right? That's a good, I think that's a good way, a great way of wrapping this up. Why not? I'm I'm totally with you. I do believe in uh, solving problems and using the uh, and applying the Occam's razor. Uh, the, the simplest solution to the problem is usually the best one. And um, and the, this type of AI um, doesn't help. Uh, I I use it myself because it's a term that people, when they hear it, uh, at least they heard of it. Um, but I agree with you; it's not really helpful. And I, we should also be responsible uh, in the way that we talk about it. To to we should we should simply we should make things more clear and not more complicated when we talk about them. Um, I agree with you. Thank you, Walt, for joining us. Super um, fun, I, Paolo. I just have one more question. Do you have um and uh, do you have any advice for people? Uh, I think you said it already, but um, maybe you could summarize it. For a company, let's say, that wants to, um, that somehow feels the need to introduce technology and hears about the hype of AI and approaches you or approaches uh, uh, some other company and says, okay, I would like to, to use AI to solve this. What would be your advice to them? Well, I would, it's not, it's not much different than my advice to a company making any decision about trying to reach out to others to help them achieve their goal, right? So I would start with, um, uh, does, does your <clears throat> solution closely fit my problem? And it shouldn't be it shouldn't be difficult for you to understand the fit, okay. right? Yeah. And and then I would I would say, have you done it before? Right? Okay. Like in in some meaningful number of places, right? Yeah. Um 
and and obviously did it work right and then um the what do i need to do to make sure that it works what what's my responsibility as a what will you be looking for me to do because in some cases you might put in front of them to our conversation earlier around the, the kind of alignment and you need to say right up front if you don't have this alignment it's not going to work right but i would they should definitely ask that right and then that that can get into even more detailed questions around like how much data do i need to have right and then how do i explain the results right mm -hmm. and then are there any things that it will do besides solving my problem okay like, is there any chance that it's going to do something else right that i don't want that it does that i don't want <laughs> okay yeah. so i would ask those questions those are those are good questions thanks again Walt, for joining us it was a pleasure i think we could be talking for hours here we'll uh um, get you to get you out here and we'll uh we'll do it in the summertime when it's not snowing yeah let's let's do it again Definitely. Yeah, for sure. And um, thanks again for your time. And uh, uh, thank you for watching and listening to our podcast episode. Don't forget to give us a like or to follow us or to subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our podcast on Apple, Google, or Spotify. And uh, see you soon. Thanks, Paolo. Thanks, Paolo.